The value of things is absolute, here in the questionable practical sense, where a process of the will definitely stops. This stopping naturally does not need to be an extensive pause in time, but only the end of a series of innervations so that the continued life of the will manifests itself in new innervations after the sense of satisfaction has been exhausted. On the other hand, an object is relatively valuable if the sense of its value is thereby conditioned by the realization of an absolute value, the relativity of its value is demonstrated by the fact that the value is lost at the moment when another means for the same end is discovered which is superior and more easily attainable. This contrast between absolute and relative value does not coincide with the contrast between objective and subjective value, since the former may evolve in both of these forms of value. I have used the concepts of value and purpose here as largely identical, in this context, they are in fact only different aspects of one and the same phenomenon, the actual conception which, according to its theoretical emotive meaning, is a value is a purpose from a practical volitional point of view. The psychic energies that posit one or the other kind of values and purposes are of a very different nature. The creation of a final purpose is, under all circumstances, possible only by a spontaneous act of the will, whereas the relative value of a means can only be adjudged by way of theoretical knowledge. The setting of the goal arises from the character, from the mood and from the interest, but the road is determined by the nature of things. The notion that we are free with regard to the first step but slaves with regard to the second is nowhere more applicable than in the teleological sphere. However, this opposition, which discloses the great variety of relations between our inner forces and objective being, in no way hinders one and the same content from shifting from one category to the other. It is precisely the spontaneity in setting the final purpose, together with the fact that the means psychologically participate in the value of their goal, that enables the means to acquire the quality of a definite autonomous value for itself in our consciousness. This is possible only because the final authority of our will is independent of all rational logical foundation, yet the fact itself serves the expediency of the end even though it appears to run counter to it. It is in no way certain, but rather can only be valid at a cursory glance, that we attain our purposes best if we can see them clearly. The concept of unconscious purpose may seem difficult and imperfect, yet the fact that, on the one hand, our actions in their most precise adaptation are focused on certain final objectives and are incomprehensible without any effectiveness, whereas on the other hand our consciousness is unaware of it, repeats itself so often and is so crucial for our whole mode of existence that we cannot do without a specific term for it. The expression unconscious purpose is intended not to explain this phenomenon, but merely to designate it. The problem becomes clearer if we constantly keep in mind the fact that our actions are never caused by a purpose, by something that will happen, but always only through it as a physio-psychic energy which exists prior to action. Consequently, we may assume the following state of affairs. On the one hand, all our activities are directed by the central forces of our innermost self, on the other they are directed by the coincidence of sense impressions moods, external stimuli, and determinations. Both sets of factors occur in very varied combinations. Our actions are more appropriate to the extent that the first factor prevails, by turning all the various given elements in the direction of the energies which emerge from the mental self in its restricted sense. If we have accumulated a considerable quantity of suspended energy to such an extent that its discharge persistently follows in the predominant direction, a constellation which, in its form, is realized identically in secondary and objectionable interests, then this real physio-psychic power, if it is mirrored in our conceptual consciousness is called purpose. The awareness of the purpose, as the mental reflection of this suspended energy, can disappear during the actual process of the further development of the purpose, because its real foundation is conceived as dissolving, by being slowly transposed into action it continues to exist only in its effects. 
even. Though it is true that, according to the structure of our memory, the original notion of purpose may survive any real foundation and continue to exist in our consciousness, this is not necessary for the actions that seem to be permeated and guided by this foundation. Further, if this construction is correct, then it follows that, to deal with teleological sequences, only the presence of the original unit of energy, that is the original existence of purpose as such, is required. The substantial force of energy survives in the succeeding action, which remains guided from the outset by the purpose, regardless of whether or not the awareness of purpose accompanies the practical sequence any longer. If the consciousness of purpose remains alive then it is not only something purely ideal, but also a process that consumes the organic strength and intensity of consciousness, the general practicality of life will therefore tend to eliminate it, since, apart from any complications and diversions, it is basically no longer necessary for the teleological guidance of our actions. This seems to make clear the phenomenon found in our experience, namely that the ultimate link of our practical sequences, which can be realized only through the means, will be all the better realized the more our strength is focused and concentrated on producing these means. The real practical question is then the production of means. The more it is completely solved, then the easier it is for the final purpose to dispense with. The effort of the will, and this can be accomplished as the mechanical result of the means. If we are constantly conscious of the final purpose, then a certain amount of strength is withdrawn from the labor by the means. The most expedient attitude is that of the complete concentration of one's energies on that stage of the sequence of purposes that should be realized next. In other words, one cannot promote the final purpose any better than to treat the means as if it were the end itself. The distribution of psychological stress that is required when the available forces are limited does not coincide with the logical organization, whereas for the latter the means is completely indifferent and the whole emphasis is on the end, practical expediency requires the direct psychological reverse of this relationship. This apparently irrational fact is of immeasurable value to mankind. In all probability, we would never have advanced beyond the setting of the most primitive tasks if our consciousness had been preoccupied with them, and we would never have been free to develop a greater variety of means, or we would have experienced an unbearable and crippling fragmentation if we had had to be constantly aware of the whole sequence of means for the ultimate purpose while working on each subordinate means. Finally, we would have had neither the strength nor the interest for the immediate task if we had realized the logical insignificance of the means in relation to the ultimate ends and if we had not focused the whole collective strength of our consciousness on what is necessary at any one time. It is obvious that this metempsychosis of the final end occurs more frequently and thoroughly, the more complicated are the techniques of life.